Hey you guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to our Fallout 4 deep dive series. In this series, we take a look into unique locations, factions, and items within the Fallout franchise. Now, before we get started, please consider subscribing if you're new here for more great Fallout content in the future and join our growing community here on YouTube. And if you're a returning viewer, your continued support is greatly appreciated, so be sure to like and share the video if you enjoy the content today. Now, we're going to be spending some time exploring Hubris Comics as not only a company, a unique location, but unique items, and uncover the impact the company had on the Boston Commonwealth leading up to the Great War. Be sure to grab your favorite issue of Grognak the Barbarian, and let's dive into Hubris Comics. When stumbling through the Boston Commonwealth on our way to locate Swan's Pond, the sole survivor will stumble upon a location recognized as Hubris Comics. The shop entrance is tucked away in a fashion that at one time would be considered niche and welcoming to fans of the fantasy and comic adventures genre. Hubris Comics at one point was a builder of pop culture spanning to the surrounding areas, even extending as far as the capital wasteland of Fallout 3, and the Appalachias of Fallout 76. While today's video will be strictly focusing on the Boston Commonwealth Fallout 4 location, we will be spending some time discussing the company as a whole and notable details of the locations. In a future video, we'll be covering the Fallout 3 and Fallout 76 locations specifically. If you're new to the series or have just simply not dove in the Hooper's comics, the impact the company has had on the Fallout universe may not be apparent to the player. I certainly wasn't as in tune with it before researching for this video, but majority of the notable comic series the protagonists from both Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 can discover were in some way touched by Hooper's comics. For me, the most recognizable installments are Grognak the Barbarian, The Silver Shroud, the Adventures of Captain Cosmos, and Mistress of Mystery. Other publications include The Unstoppables, The Inspector, Manta Man, Drake Tungsten, Chrono Cowboy, Hell's Chain Gang, Kid Wacky Zany Hijinks, Tales from the Front, Underground Life, and iDog. We are specifically focusing in on Hubris Comics within the Fallout 4 Boston Commonwealth area and the company as a whole, but if you guys are at all interested in looking in any of the specifics from any of these comics in a future video, just let me know in the comments below, as I believe this could be an interesting dive that I've not seen many channels do. Now to give some further insight into the format of today's upload, we're going to be looking at specifically a dive into the history of Huber's comics, the layout and location within Fallout 4, and lastly, we're going to be uncovering the history of what took place within the Hubris Comics location of Fallout 4. So if there's a section you're specifically interested in, be sure to see the timestamps down in the description. As previously mentioned, Hubris Comics was a pre-war company established in entertainment. The company was founded in 2021 and was a subsidiary of Hubris Publishing and was headquartered in Washington, D.C. This location is discoverable in Fallout 3. The most notable comic book series produced by Hubris would have had to have been Grognak the Barbarian, as the comic has been featured as a perk item in both Fallout 3 and 4 that the player can discover many, many issues of it during their adventures. In Fallout 4, the player can locate the Grognak costume and the axe as well as the Silver Shroud suit, hat, and gun. And we'll talk more about this here shortly. In the year 2062, Hubris decided it was time to branch out into other entertainment industries, so Hubris Comics Game Studio was born, and it was used to publish holotape games. Games such as Wasteland and Gragnock and the Ruby Ruins were published by the company, and the studio even began development of their own game before the bombs fell. The code name for this project was Reign of Greylock, which was in its beta stages just before the Great War. Hubris's influence had expanded to the point that the company began collaborations with other major companies such as vault Corporation, and this allowed them to include vault Boy in their Hell's Chain Gang series as well as the Underground Life series. They even went as far as producing propaganda comics for the U.S. government. 
This series was known as Tales from the Front. They had even branched out into classic board games and produced one titled Unstoppable Shindig Board Game, which allowed up to five participants to take on the roles of the Unstoppable Heroes. Hubris was a company that was very influential with the pop culture scene pre-Great War, and that's made very clear by their ability to expand beyond the capital wasteland of Fallout 3. Today's video is focused on the location within the Boston Commonwealth, but it's very important to know that they have offices in other locations throughout the central and eastern U.S. The original headquarters was founded in the north end of the Mason District of Washington, D.C., and this is a location that's discoverable for the player in the Fallout 3 experience that you can spend time exploring. Then there's a Hubris Comics and Toys that's located in the Watoga Shopping Plaza in the Appalachias of Fallout 76. And this office is sitting between the Watoga Real Estate and Miller's Appliances, and it's offered great access to Hubris products before the Great War. Again, these two locations will be covered in a future video whenever we get to Fallout 3, as well as Fallout 76, so be on the lookout for that in the future. But again, the location we're focusing on today is Hubris Comics of the Boston Commonwealth. It's a part of the Back Bay and is a very cozy little building containing comics, toys, and a production studio. When approaching the entrance to the location, we'll notice that there's a corpse of a man just named Scavenger. If we take the time and loot them, we'll discover a note titled Scavenger's Lead, which reads, Check out Hubris Comics, up Newbury Street. Store on the ground floor, ought to be easy pickings. VB. Upon entry to the comic store, it may not seem like too much stands out as the location appears to have been in disarray for quite some time. But taking into account the scavenger's lead, there must be something unique specifically on the ground floor. And after clearing the ghouls out on the ground floor, we can spend some time looking through the shelves and the cashier's desk. It's important to note that this is a great location for junk farming. I return here often, even as a high level character, to grab fans, lamps, cans, and toys for crafting or junk items. Just behind the cashier's counter, we'll notice a glass case with an axe stored in it. If successfully picked, the case will contain the grognock axe. This requires a lockpick rank of 1 to pick advanced level locks. Once received, grognock's axe is an incredible weapon for melee builds. Hits from this weapon causes a higher stagger chance and the targets take bleed damage. This axe also has an extremely unusual hidden effect of requiring less AP to use when swinging. Perks that stack well with this weapon are Big Leagues and Bloody Mess. Continuing our search through the cashier's counter, we'll find the Hubris Comics storeroom key. This key allows us to access the storeroom behind the counter along with the expert locked wall safe in the storeroom. It's important to note that this safe can also be opened via hacking the cashier's terminal. When entering into the storeroom, the player will discover another dead scavenger and on them the scavenger's note. The note allows us to understand how even in a post-war destroyed commonwealth, there still lies a value in collector's items such as comics and costumes. Can't believe I signed on for this. Who wants this crap? Collectors, the boss says. So who's the fool here? Them or us? This only further solidifies the idea that this company has had a lasting impact on culture within the Fallout universe. After concluding exploration of the first floor and making our way up to the second floor, there will be more feral ghouls to encounter along with other several notable pieces of loot to help unfold previous events within the location. If we head up the stairs directly in front of the first floor elevator, under one of the two sets of stairs which leads to the third floor in the northeast corner, one will find the scavenger's list. It is placed on a corpse through the hole in the wall and the list notes, Stuff worth coming back for? Axe. Boss said it was too heavy to bother with, but someone will buy it. Comic books. Have to be one or two that are still legible. Always good for a few caps. Storeroom. Just need someone who can pick that lock. Have to check with Carl. Maybe he could get Ken Standish for the job. Damn monkey creeps me out. Once we make it to the top of the stairs into the second floor, 
and we head to the office on the right. On the wall of the left side of the office, there will be a photograph of the Silver Shroud in a case. It's signed, Best Wishes, The Silver Shroud. After fully clearing the second floor of all ghouls and exploring the room to the south, there will be a desk with the manager's terminal on it. If we search the desk, we will locate the Hubris Comics office key. And please note that there's a second copy of this key that can be located underneath the desk just outside the manager's door. And the last notable item that the player can discover is a Nuka-Cola Quantum, which is found in the Nuka-Cola machine in the break room within the southeast corner of the second floor. As we approach the third floor, it's very likely all ghouls located on the first, second, and third floors have already been cleared due to aggroing on the player. So most of the time you can focus on exploring for a minute. But if there's any remaining ghouls, be sure to take those out and if the Hubris Comics office key was located on the second floor, the sole survivor can then access the office lock behind the expert level lockpick. This office contains a desk with a terminal, a safe with stem packs, mint hats, and along with the silver shroud script on the desk, which also contains some great mint hats. Shortly, we'll be taking a look at what was involved with the production of the silver shroud and review the script. As, long, as well as the other issues at hand within the walls of this location. So stay tuned for that. Fucking cow! While the third floor did not contain as many unique items, it gave us a bit of an insight of what to expect by the time we made our way to the fourth and final floor. Upon entering the fourth floor, the sole survivor will be greeted by several feral ghouls and a glowing one. After taking the time to clear them out, the player can take a look around and realize that they're on the set for filming the Red About Silver Shroud show. If the player further explores this floor, they can locate the Silver Shroud costume and hat located on the mannequin by the backdrop of the opposite corner of the stairs where we entered the room. And further looking behind the backdrop, we can then locate the Silver Shroud gun prop. Bingo. While this get up is not as useful to us in this moment, there's a quest line later given to us in Good Neighbor in which this costume is required, so it's important to go ahead and grab these items and store them for later use. The costume is considered a legendary item and if equipped alongside the hat, a temporary reduction of 15% of damage dealt by both human and ghoul enemies and a temporary plus one to agility with the coat as well as a plus one perception to the hat is implemented. It's important to note, while the damage and energy resistance is poor, the radiation resistance is decent and can later be upgraded to the silver shroud armor and gain better damage and energy stats. If we move back to the stairs we entered in on and move to the southwest corner where the lockers are, we can then locate the grognak costume. The costume is a recreation of the one worn by the comic book character, Grognak the Barbarian. If the costume is equipped, then the sole survivor will then have a temporary 25% increase to damage dealt with melee weapons, as well as a temporary increase to strength by plus two. This costume is unique because modular armor pieces can still be equipped while wearing the costume. It's important to note though, that this only works with leg and arm pieces and equipping any chest armor will remove the costume. After locating the Grognak costume, the player can investigate the bathroom in the opposite corner next to the loot chest. Once picking the lock, a copy of Astoundingly Awesome Tales issue number 4 can be found on the end table, 
And this issue increases damage with the Alien Blaster by 5%, which is a great find for future usage of the Alien Blaster. As the sole survivor is exploring this location, they will uncover a lot of information via terminal entries and notes that indicate what took place here before the bombs fell. While on the outside, Hubert Comics appeared to be a very welcoming and well put together organization, it's uncovered that it's not exactly the case. We know there was a production of a Silver Shroud show in the works following the success of the radio show on the Galaxy News Radio. But if we take the time to investigate the terminal entries on each floor, we can quickly recover there are many issues within the staff involving casting, script creation timeline, something I understand all too well, and what appears to be a very stressful work environment. The player is given the first insight of stress within the Hubris Comics walls when reading the comic book store terminal entries. When reviewing the order tracking entry we are given insight to the pre-orders for upcoming comics requested by customers which as a former employee of everyone's favorite game store gamestop this entry seemed all too familiar to me the entry that stood out to me the most though was the new subscribers entry when taking the time to read it we can see even the employees at ground level were being rushed to gain a higher level of subscribers new subscribers our in-store subscription numbers remain dangerously low. We need to start laying on the hard sell. Just remind the customers we do all the work. They just come in and pick up the issues. Oh, and it's 5% cheaper than doing it as a direct home mail order. Fortunately, we have had some new subscribers. In terms of issues upstairs, if we bounce between the manager's terminal, the writer's terminal, and the producer's terminal, we can see that there was a high level of disagreement between several departments when preparing for the filming of the Silver Shroud television show. 10-11-77 From Tina Hopkins to Vivian Odell Subject Now an English butler? I came into work today and found another stealth revision to the shooting script. Now the Shroud had us an English butler? I keep telling Babowski that we need our core fans to be our evangelicist. So we can't keep making these stupid little changes. You have to talk to him before you go on vacation. Otherwise, I swear, I'm bringing it up to Pete. 10 11 77 From Vivian Odell to Tina Hopkins Subject Now an English butler? I'll talk with Mr. Babowski, but I wouldn't get my hopes up. Pete brought him in because he gets television. We have to accept that there's going to be changes to get the small screen. I agree our fans are important, but the Silver Shroud's numbers outside of Boston's are, well, not ideal. A lot is riding on the success of the pilot. If Mr. Babowski thinks an English butler could help with the show, please hear him out. I love the work you and Vince have done with the Shroud. We wouldn't be shooting this show without you. I know it's tough, but hang in there. 10 14 77 from Evans Rochelle to Aaron Babowski subject Claire can't wait I tried stalling her but things are spiraling over here her agent was having dinner with Maxwell over at the Derby not good Claire's still on board she loves the script she especially loves the outfit you got the shots of that right yowza so I don't care what's going on over there. We need to sign her before we lose her to the Wisemans or someone else. We looked into that Hopkins contract. It's ironclad. The only way she's out of it is if she walks. Her partner signed over his rights to the hubris, but she still has hers. If she even thinks of going to a lawyer, you got to work your magic, Babo. Imagine if we needed her for approval. 10 15 77 from Tina Hopkins to Vivian Odell. Subject, please help. I want to pull my hair out. Babowski has cast and signed a contract with Claire Riddell for the role of the Mistress of Mystery? I don't care how much the tomb of Amun Ra grossed. The Mistress of Mystery is a brunette, not a blonde, brown, and definitely not a redhead. And have you heard Claire's voice? The Mistress of Mystery is confident, a match for the Shroud at his best day. Not some half-starved waif that's known for her shrill screaming. Shannon Rivers has worked for us for decades, 
She is the voice of the Mistress of Mystery. End of story. She's even a natural brunette. She's not as young as Claire, but surely we can do something with lighting to help with that. If we don't fix this, I swear, I'm walking. I won't have my name in the credits for this train wreck. 101577 from Vivian Odell to Tina Hopkins. Subject, please help. Shannon is family. I promise you I will fight for this. This needs to be resolved before Sunday. I'm not canceling my honeymoon again over this. Make sure Babowski doesn't sneak out before I can grab him. 10, 15, 77 from Vivian Odell to Aaron Babowski. Subject, Mistress of Mystery Casting. It has come to my attention you've hired Claire Riddell for the role of the Mistress of Mystery for the show. This is unacceptable. The Mistress of Mystery has an iconic look. She must be a brunette. The Mistress of Mystery is a strong female protagonist, not some damsel in distress. Shannon Rivers has voiced M.O.M. for years and is beloved in The Shroud and every other radio drama she's ever been a part of. I know we've had our differences, but this affects more than The Silver Shroud, and the M.O.M. and The Unstoppables are big brands. We absolutely must talk before I go on my vacation. 10 16 77 From Aaron Babowski to Vivian Odell Subject, Mistress of Mystery Casting Vivi, relax. If it's that important to you, maybe we can put Claire in a wig. But the contract is signed, so this is happening. What is it with you guys and Mrs. Rivers anyways? Maybe 20 years ago, but now she's got a face made for radio. Am I right? Claire's got star power and that's what we need. I talked with PD Boy and he's agreed to a couple new scenes. We need romance and Claire's got the goods. If Tina can't roll with this, then I can fly in one of my boys from Hollywood. He's a class act. I got a full schedule today. Dress rehearsals until 8. This can't wait until you're back from the Bahamas. So if we have to meet, 8's my only window. 10 18 77. From Peter Shiner to Aaron Babowski. Subject, MOM casting. Vivi got a hold of me before she left. I got the photos of Claire and she's dynamite. Love the alterations on the costume. It still feels like a, the comic, but more believable. So I'll back you there. But I'm with Vivi. MOM's a brunette, period. And her voice needs to be strong. Claire's voice isn't. Can we have Shannon dub over Claire and post? That's the word, right? That would be the best for both worlds. 10-20-77 from Aaron Babowski to Tina Hopkins. Subject, I need lines. I don't know how you do things in radio, but we got catering, Foley's, best men, and actors sitting around on their tushes because of your most recent delay. We're not writing Shakespeare here. It's TV, right? I know you don't like the new monkey, but Focus loves him. He's testing better than Claire in that silly wig. Speaking of which, Claire's agent's really not loving the wig. Really, really not loving it. Claire's flying in Monday, and by then, I think it's best if the mink's the wig. Am I right, or what? And Shannon's being a real peach, standing in for her while Claire wraps up her film, but it may be best if she's not around when Claire flies in. Will you take care of that? Thanks. 10, 20, 77. From Tina Hopkins to Aaron Babowski. Subject, I quit. Effective immediately, I quit. You can explain to Petey how you lost the lead writer for the Silver Shroud, and after everything Shannon has put up with, if you want to fire her, do it yourself. Manicor has been wanting to hire me for years. Looks like your loss is their gain. After reading these, it truly seems as if the Hubert's comics was heading down a difficult path leading up to the production of this show, and in terms of cinema quality, it may have been a blessing in disguise that the bombs fell when they did. Hubert's comics was an industry leader in the world of nerd entertainment in the Fallout universe. They were slowly taking over before the Great War and remained a lusted after lineup of post-war entertainment. Scavengers were willing to die in order to attempt gathering the goods within its walls. If it wasn't a big enough indicator of the brand's influence, billboards and marketing can be seen all throughout the Fallout universe referencing characters from the different IPs. Did you spend time exploring Huber's comics in any of the Fallout games? 
If so, who is your favorite character? And do you utilize either the Silver Shroud or Gragnot cost when playing Fallout 4? I want to take the time to state a special thank you to all of our patrons that continue to support the content here on the channel. And if you're interested in becoming a patron and supporting the production of future Fallout content, be sure to check Patreon link down in the description below. If you made it this far, be sure to like and share the video, and of course if you're new here, subscribe. Lastly, be sure to wash the blood from your Gragnock costume and oil your axe, and I'll see you on the next episode of our Fallout Deep Dive series.